Uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jim Robinson. I am the interim dean of the Divinity School, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you today to the 2022 John Nuveen Lecture. John Nuveen was one of Chicago's most influential business leaders and an active civil and cultural leader with ties to many educational institutions. At the University of Chicago, he served as a trustee, as chair of the university's alumni association, and most importantly, as a trustee of the Baptist Theological Union, which established the Nuveen Lecture in his honor in 1972. Each year, a prominent member of the university's faculty is invited by the Baptist Theological Union and the Divinity School to deliver the Nuveen Lecture. Today, I'm honored to welcome Tahra Kutbuddin, Professor of Arabic Literature and Islamic Studies in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, now with a new name. Um, she is also a member of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies and Associate Faculty of the Divinity School with students working on a wide range of subjects across not only NELC, but also divinity and comparative literature. She was also the long-term chair of the undergraduate interdisciplinary studies in the humanities major. A world-renowned scholar of classical Arabic literature and Islamic studies, Professor Kutbuddin's work focuses on intersections of the literary, the religious, and the political in classical Arabic poetry and prose. Her research interests include Arabic oratory and Islamic preaching, literary features and symbolic exegesis of the Quran, ethical hadith traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, sermons of Imam Ali, broad features of classical Arabic poetry, women from the family of the Prophet, Arabic in India, and so very much more. Her current projects include editing and translating the compilation of Ali's sermons entitled Path of Eloquence, as well as a monograph on Ali's religio-political career and ethical preaching based on his sermons and epistles supported by Guggenheim Fellowship. Her latest monograph, Arabic Oration, Art and Function, a substantial book, was awarded the prestigious Sheikh Zayed Book Award for 2021. The book presents a comprehensive theory of this preeminent genre in its foundational oral period and its continuing influence on the contemporary Muslim sermon. Today's lecture draws on 10 years of research for that book. In her lecture, Professor Kutbuddin will discuss the major features of classical Arabic oration with a focus on religion, ritual, and the rhetoric of orality. Those of you here today and those of you joining us live stream are particularly lucky to hear from Professor Kutbuddin, who will be leaving us at the end of the academic year for Oxford University to occupy the oldest chair of Arabic studies dating back to the 17th century, a very prestigious chair. Tahra, we will miss you, and I will add that Angela, and I will miss you uh, especially as well. We have known each other a very long time, going back to the first years of graduate school, so we will miss you very much, Tahra. I'm so pleased that you were able to accept our invitation to speak to us today. And now, please join me in welcoming Tahra Kutbuddin to deliver the 2022 Nuveen Lecture, Early Islamic Oration, Colon, rhetoric, religion, and ritual. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, and before I begin, I want to thank the Novin Foundation, the University of Chicago's Divinity School, and Divinity School Dean, Professor James Robinson, for inviting me to speak today. Thank you also, Jim, for your kind, infor kind introduction, and I am going to miss you and Angela and all of you uh, when I leave here for Oxford next year, very much so. So I particularly appreciate this opportunity to speak to the uh, UChicago community uh, once more before I leave. All right. In my lecture today, I want to talk about Arabic oration, 
in its foundational oral period in early Islam. This is a vast and complex topic with diverse dimensions, and today I'll address some of its rhetorical, religious, and ritual aspects. In my first section on rhetoric, I'll discuss the oral milieu of early Islamic oration and its aesthetic, memory-based techniques. In the second section on religion, I'll discuss the main pious themes of early oration and their diffusion across political and military speech making. In the third section on ritual, I'll say a few words about ceremonial aspects of the oration that served, among other things, as a mode of authority assertion. Altogether, I'll present the religious face of Arabic oration in early Islam and some of its interconnections with art and society. All right, so before I get to the three sections of my lecture, here are a few quick preliminaries. Oration is the English term that I've used to translate the Arabic word khutbah. Uh, it refers in the early period to speeches, sermons, and other forms of public address on a variety of religious, political, military, and other important functions. It follows a standard structure and formal conventions. In modern times, as many of you may know, khutbah refers almost entirely to the Friday sermon. Uh, but that was not the case in its original iteration. At that time, the Friday sermon was just one of many types of orations declaimed across the Middle East. In the early Islamic world of the 7th and 8th centuries AD, religion, politics, and aesthetics coalesced in the rich art of Arabic oration. The first generations of Muslims, and their forebears in the Arabian Peninsula, lived in a largely oral realm, and they cultivated the art of the rhythmic spoken word. Their speeches and sermons were exquisite in rhetorical craftsmanship. On the one hand, oration in this period was a fundamental art form. Rather than focusing on painting or sculpture or music, the early Arabians focused their aesthetic talents on eloquent verbal creations. And these eloquent verbal creations, the orations, comprise some of the most beautiful and powerful expressions in the Arabic canon. Oratory, together with the Quran and poetry, was foundational in the earliest Arabic literary tradition, and it reigned supreme for more than a century as the preeminent genre of prose. Oration's artistic formulation was also the loom on which the community's movers and shakers wove their religious and political discourse. It was the chief form of public address and had central administrative, social, and devotional functions. It was the primary means of government, the major tool for negotiating authority, and the key vehicle for doctrinal instruction. It roused warriors to battle, codified legislation on civic and criminal matters, and it raised awareness of the imminence of death and the importance of leading a virtuous life. It called listeners to the new religion, and it formed part of its ritual worship. In addition to being a vital piece of the Arabic literary landscape then, it was an essential component of political, military, and spiritual leadership. Uh, Professor Robinson just mentioned that I've published a book recently titled Arabic Oration, Art, and Function. And I'd like to share with you the trajectory of this book very briefly, uh, which addresses, the book addresses many dimensions of the ritual and social dynamics of religious speech. The bulk of the book examines large aspects of classical Arabic oration. Its preservation and authenticity, genres and themes, structures and style, aesthetics of orality and persuasion, and orator audience authority dynamics. The book's book begins with chapters that discuss the characteristics of early oration that I just mentioned. These are followed by chapters that treat its four major types, the Sermon of Pious Council, the Friday and Eid Sermon, the Battle Oration, and the Political Speech. Uh, these are followed by analysis of theological, legislative, and other less common types of, of oration, as well as the few women's orations that uh, are recorded by our texts. Now, in all of these chapters, the discussion is mapped onto four chronologically developing grid lines. 
so pagan to Islamic, tribal to imperial, nomadic to urban, and oral to written. I've gone on in the book to explore how this spoken tradition influenced the major written genres of Arabic literature, beginning with the chancery epistle, the Risala. And in the final chapter, I've investigated how the legacy of early Arabic oration continues to shape the idiom and concepts of religion and politics across the modern Islamic world. Altogether, um, I, I attempt to present a, a kind of a comprehensive look at Arabic oratory, and I try to kind of do a broad and as well as a deep analysis of the texts and of the practice of oratory in the foundational oral period, uh, just before and immediately after the advent of Islam. And I also look um, to the continu continuing legacy of this material in medieval and modern times. Now, to the first of my three sections in this lecture, the notion of rhetoric in the classical oration. In order to persuade, in order to convince, in order to achieve their exhortative goals. The orator needed to pack a powerful aesthetic punch. And as I've already mentioned, oration texts found in the medieval sources include some of the most beautiful and powerful expressions of the Arabic literary canon. But wherein lay its beauty and power? Did orators randomly pick and choose aesthetic features? or were there characteristics that they privileged? More importantly, what drove their artistic choices? I argue that the classical Arabic, Arabic oration's stylistic choices stem from its oral culture. Now, from the vantage point of the 21st century, we access Arabic oration, early Arabic oration, through historical and literary sources, and from many genres of books from the medieval library. In other words, we engage with it as written text. Because of this, and because of our own experience with how our own modern day speeches and sermons are produced, we fall into the trap of unconsciously assuming for early Arabic oration a similar mode of being. We look at it with the anachronistic eyes of a, of, of a society, from, of a people from a fully reading and writing society. For us, the presence of written texts all around is given fact. Even when we encounter orality today, it's a secondary orality that is dependent on writing and print. We measure orality against literacy, never on its own terms. But although early Arabic orations have come to us on paper, it's important to acknowledge that they were not created as written texts. When we read orations in the medieval sources, we're in fact reading texts that were produced and at first instance transmitted orally. Unless we recognize their orality, we can't fully appreciate their character. It's also important to, to, to keep in mind the limitations of this orality, because the pre-Islamic and early Islamic milieu was no stranger to writing. But although Arabic oration lay between orality and writing, it was closer to the oral end of the spectrum. So let's imagine a sliding scale between pristine orality, in which there's absolutely no writing, and a fully literate society in which writing is an integral part of the culture. So for example, certain tribes living in the Congo and Amazon rainforest today versus the contemporary United States and Europe. Although writing was known in Middle Eastern lands in the period of our study, it was a skill limited to a tiny proportion of the populace. They laboriously employed crude instruments of writing, such as rock, bone, and skin, and later parchment and papyrus, and they reserved their writing for momentous occasions. Pre-Islamic and early Islamic society was predominantly oral. Now, a major aspect of the artistic verbal production of an oral milieu is mnemonic design. So mnemonic design means that its aesthetic format helps the brain to remember. And Walter Ong in his pioneering book, Orality and Literacy, has demonstrated that artistic expression in an oral culture is essentially mnemonic. He explains these mnemonics thus. In a primary oral culture, to solve the pro problem of retaining and retrieving carefully articulated thought, you have to do your thinking in mnemonic patterns shaped for ready oral recurrence. Your thought must come into being in heavily rhythmic balanced patterns in repetitions or antitheses, in alliter alliterations and assonances, 
and so on. And he goes on to say that serious thought is intertwined with memory systems. Um, I should say that I don't subscribe to Ong's further conclusions about analytical thought being contingent on writing. I think he makes a, an unwarranted and rather dangerous leap there. Uh, and I've talked about it a little bit in, quite in some detail in, in my book. Um, nevertheless, I find his ideas about the stylistic features of oral literature, literature persuasive and the ideas of you know, John Miles Foley, Susan Nidditch, and other uh, scholars of orality who have done excellent work on oral literature. And these uh, works and these ideas and, and theories are really helpful for my analysis. Ong goes on to say that orality-rooted speakers will ground their ideas in the material world around them. They'll represent their ideas graphically and visually rather than in abstract form. So on the one hand, you have you know, the, the mnemonic patterns of, of rhythm. On the other hand, you have the mnemonic patterns of graphic visual imagery. They'll speak about a ball, for example, rather than a sphere, about a plate rather than a circle. And they'll repeat their key message, sometimes using the same language, sometimes using different words, which is a mnemonic characteristic, also a metonymic characteristic. But again, I'm not going to talk about metonymy today. These ideas map onto early Arabic oration in which the two essential mnemonic features are vivid imagery and pulsating rhythm. I'll share with you uh, some examples of imagery and much of it relates to desert flora, fauna, and natural phenomena, and much of it is based on animals. So Ali ibn Abi Talib was the cousin, ward, and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, Prophet's successor according to the Shia and the fourth rightly guided caliph according to the Sunnis. He was a master orator, renowned as the sage of Islam. In various sermons, he compares the world to the sneeze of a goat, a fart, the fart of a goat, a leaf being chomped in the mouth of a locust, the bones of a pig in the, hands of, in the hand of a leper, Iraqi khinzirin fi de majzum. All right, instead of simply stating that the world has little worth, he illustrates its low worth through graphic images that convey this abstract idea in concrete physical terms. And I think if you don't take away anything else from this lecture, you're going to take away the bones of a pig in the hand of a leper. Yeah? <laughs> it spikes in the, in the mind, and, and it's hard to get out, actually, ever. Uh, so be warned. <laughs> now we have the Umayyad governor of Iraq, Hajjaj, speaking of his subjects' rising stages of wickedness. And he addresses them and says, truly Satan penetrated you, permeating flesh, blood, and nerves, ears, and fingers, limbs, and heart. Then he rose into brain, marrow, and inner ear. Then he climbed further and made a nest. Then he laid eggs and hatched chicks. <laughs> now Hajjaj's extended metaphor may be described as a form of dramatization uh, as can the next example, the rationalist theologian Wasil ibn Atta asked rhetorically in an Ubi Sunt sermon that begins, where are the kings who built Ctesiphon? And he answers, death grabbed them along with their howdahs. It crushed them with its breast. It chomped on them with its canines. Now, these graphic images familiar to the audience help the orator bring abstractions into the realm of the immediate audiovisual, and they helped fix the texts in the audience's memory. Another key feature of the oration's style was rhythm. And modern neuroscientists explain memory formation through the brain's propensity to organize information in patterns they call the process neural entrainment or neuro neuronal entrainment. Children learn the ABC, for example, through a melody. Imagine how much more difficult it would be to memorize a random list of letters. Yeah. Now, rhythm is present in many forms, even in a society which communicates regularly through writing. But in the artistic expressions of an oral society, it's a primary characteristic. Among the features that create rhythm, the main feature in classical Arabic Oration is the consistent, almost relentless use of parallelism, where two sentences possess identical grammar. The Arabic term is isdiwaj. Their structural units are thus parallel to each other. So this is another Umayyad governor, Ziyad ibn Abihi, 
uh, warning the rebellious people of Basra about severe punishments for criminal activity. And he says, whoever drowns people, I shall drown him. Whoever burns people, I shall burn him. Notice the parallel structure, right, in every single sentence. Whoever breaches a house, I shall breach his heart. Whoever digs up and robs a grave, I shall bury him in it alive. So I'm glad I'm not standing in front of Hajj, uh, Ziyad today, <laughs> or Hajjad for that matter. But it, it, it illustrates beautifully, I think, the point of rhythmic uh, lines. We go on to the next slide with the pre-Islamic Christian Bishop of Najran. Qus ibn Sa'ida, who is said to have orated from the back of his red camel at the Uqayth market outside Mecca, and the Prophet him, uh, Muhammad himself is reported to have witnessed and narrated his sermon. Qus's famous sermon begins with three parallel lines. Whoever lives, dies. Yeah. Whoever dies is lost. Everything that could happen will happen. Man met. Listen also to the rhyme. Man Asha met, woman matter, fat, Wakulo Mahua at in at. All right, that's it for the part on aesthetics. I'm going to go on to the next part of my lecture, namely oration as a locus of religion in the early Islamic world. So, all types of orations in our period, including battle and political speeches, contain religious themes. I'll get to that point shortly. Uh, among the various types, Three that are most focused on religious speech are the Friday Sermon, the similar Eid Sermon, and the ad hoc sermon of pious council. Additionally, the marriage oration, the legislative oration, the theological oration, and the oration that supplicated for rain also have well-defined religious functions. Uh, here I'm going to speak of the Friday Sermon and the Sermon of Pious Council. So let me start with the Sermon of Pious Council, which contains three core Themes. These themes, as I've mentioned before, permeate all types of orations, although they're most abundant in pious council sermons. So the first theme of the pious council sermon is piety, and more specifically, consciousness of God and obedience to him. The second is imminence of death, and the third main theme is comparison of this world and the hereafter. A handful of pieces are attributed to the pre-Islamic period, while hundreds are recorded for the first two centuries of Islam. Pre-Islamic pieces focus on the transience of human life. You've seen an example in my presentation of rhythm earlier, namely the sermon by the Christian Bishop Khus that warns of the imminent end of life. After the address, if you notice, the opening rhythmic lines that I read out to you earlier drive home the inevitability of death, whoever lives dies, and so on. And then the body paragraph directs the audience to observe the natural world and take lessons from it. And it starts, truly, there are messages in the earth, there are lessons in the sky, and so on. The final lines pose rhetorical questions that leave the audience to ponder for themselves. Where do people go, and why do they never return? Islamic sermons of pious counsel, while continuing the theme of mortality, build on it to exhort the audience to perform good deeds and prepare for the eternal life to come. An example is a sermon by Imam Ali in which he urges preparation for the hereafter. So I've translate, translated the sermon rather literally here to highlight its parallel structure, and I've color-coded the lines in this slide to show parallelism. That's what the colors are for. <laughs> Uh, the first two pairs of parallel lines, for example, compare this world with the hereafter. And you'll see that a full 22 of the sermon's 23 lines are parallel. I've analyzed this sermon in an article titled A Sermon on Piety by Imam Ali, How the Rhythm of the Classical Arabic Oration Tacitly Persuaded. And I've used uh, Richard Lanham's term, tacit persuasion. Uh, I've argued there that the oration's artistry played a vital role in achieving the orator's goal of persuasion. Together with rational argumentation, the orator achieved much of his stirring of hearts and prodding of minds through literary techniques. The parallelism underscores the stark dichotomy between two opposing entities. It sets up this world against the hereafter, and it highlights the choice of good versus evil, hope versus fear, paradise versus hellfire. 
In the final line, that's in red here, uh, the sermon breaks from the parallelism and crescendos in a longer non-parallel finale that encapsulates the gist of the sermon's overall message. Take provisions in the world from the world with which you can nourish your souls tomorrow. Now, connected with reminders of death and the imminence of the hereafter, the most important theme, an umbrella theme in Islamic sermons of pious counsel is consciousness of God. The Arabic word is taqwa. Now, taqwa expresses a fundamental concept in Islam. And it's among the most frequent lexemes of the Quran and of the Prophet Muhammad's sayings or hadith. The term taqwa is ubiquitous in Muslim sermons. And sermons are permeated by the formula, I counsel you to taqwa, I counsel you to piety, usikum be taqwa Allah. Um, and these sermons frequently quote the Quranic verse, gather your provisions, the best of provisions is piety. Taqwa is often translated imprecisely, in my view, as fear of God. I have, you know, I, I think translations are really important. I think it's important, especially for certain key terms, to be very careful in how one translates, because you're conveying a whole mindset here, and they're very heavy, weighty terms. So Islam, for instance, I'm going to just digress for a moment. The word Islam, which is usually translated by scholars as submission to God. I really don't like the term. It's not incorrect, but I think commitment is a much better choice, because it conveys a sense of agency commitment to the will of God, right? You're choosing to submit to the will of God versus being passively kind of led along through with a ring through your nose. And that's, I, I think it's really important to choose your words. So here for taqwa, I think fear of God is, is not full, fully correct. Um, Muslims understand it to mean something more than simple fear. And as with many signifiers that are culture specific, no English word or phrase exactly conveys its full range of implications, but its scope comes close to the English Christian usage of God-fearing, or the biblical mosaic command in Leviticus to be holy, and the Hebrew is kedoshim. <laughs> you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Islam, taqwa means desisting from evil deeds, fearing God's retribution for any wrongs you may do, being aware that God sees and knows everything, and indeed, most importantly and paradoxically, being in awe of him while also taking comfort from his presence at all times. This attitude entails believing in God, being ever conscious of him, and thus always thinking and acting righteously. So among e leaders in early Islam, some are singled out as prolific and effective orators of pious counsel. The Prophet Muhammad is for Muslims the foremost guide and in addition to the Quran, which he is believed to have brought from God, his own words are also revered as the product of divine inspiration. His sermons are all framed in the injunction to taqwa. And I'll show you one of his Friday sermons shortly uh, when I get to the section on Friday sermons. In addition to Muhammad's sermons, the sermons of Ali are held up as the gold standard for brilliant eloquence and sage advice. This is a long sermon, and Ali describes the pious, the people of taqwa, and he lays out in minute detail the virtuous characteristics, the hereafter-focused aspirations, and the entirely godly way of life of those who truly deserve the epithet. So Ali presents in this sermon, he presents virtue and piety as two indivisible sides of the same coin. Just as virtue is incomplete without piety, piety is incomplete without virtue. So the terms are taqwa and fada'il here. Uh, the sermon begins with a general statement, the pious in this world, al-muttaqoon, are people of virtue, ahl al-fada'il. It goes on to give a list of ethical and religious traits. They speak sensibly, dress simply, walk humbly. They're deeply conscious of God's greatness and bounties. They do not care for the world. Their bodies are emaciated. It's as though they see paradise and hell in front of their eyes. I'm just picking out a few things to highlight here. Uh, they pray all night, uh, they stand before God and recite the Quran, their needs are few, their souls are chaste. They possess amazing virtues, strength in religion, maturity with gentleness, belief with conviction, passion for knowledge, moderation in wealth. They're kind to their fellow humans, they forgive those who oppress them, give to those who refuse them, show compassion to those who shun them. 
They're dignified in terms of calamity, patient in times of misfortune, grateful to God in times of ease. In sum, according to Ali, taqwa governs the totality of a believer's life, grounding her relationship with God and encompassing her relationship with all of God's creatures. Uh, these, the two lists that I'm going to show you catalog the virtues of the pious noted in this sermon. Uh, I separate the categories into religious and humanitarian virtues. I do so solely for the purposes, purpose of highlighting the strong presence of both in Ali's sermon. Uh, there's no, for, for Ali, they're all religious and they're all humanitarian. There's really no substantive difference between the two. So virtues in Ali's sermon that we presently deem religious, which speak of God, of spiritual practices, and the hereafter, are listed on this slide, and there are 23 in all. These are deemed usually humanitarian, and they relate particularly to humans' behavior toward each other, and there are 57 in all. And we go on to the next, please. All right. So taking the middle ground between secular humanism and insular faith, Ali propagates a holistic model combining individual devotion with dynamic social engagement. All this comes together in the notion of taqwa. In line with Ali's advocacy of balance in all things, here's another dimension of, this philo of his philosophy of taqwa, that of living with joy in this world yet preparing all the while for the hereafter. This is part of Ali's sermon. The pious, the people of taqwa, partake of the joys of this world and those of the next. They share the world with the worldly, but the worldly do not share the hereafter with them. In this world, they reside in the most splendid of residences and consume the finest of delicacies. They possess the sumptuous comforts of the wealthy and partake of the lavish luxuries of the mighty, yet, when they depart, they leave with full provisions and a large profit. I've analyzed both these sermons, these last sermons, in some detail in various articles, and here I've used them in a cursory fashion to give you a glimpse of the very broad scope of taqwa. Uh, I'm currently, uh, as Professor Robinson mentioned, writing a monograph on Ali's biographies, teachings, and eloquence. Uh, and I'll analyze his teaching. I plan to analyze his teachings on piety further in that book, uh, inshallah. Now, the theme of taqwa, as you'd expect, is an essential component of the Muslim Friday Sermon, the weekly communal prayer of Islam. I've been speaking so far of the Sermon of Pious Council. In fact, many sermons of Pious Council in our sources may actually be parts of Friday sermons, <laughs> but that's a discussion for another day. All right, this year is said to be Prophet Muhammad's first Friday sermon that he delivered in a hamlet in Quba on the outskirts of Medina when he migrated there from Mecca. I want you to notice that after the opening benediction in the section marked B, Muhammad says, Usikum betaqwalla, I counsel you to be conscious of God. That is the best counsel a Muslim can give a Muslim, urging him to seek the hereafter and commanding him to be conscious of God. So in section D, and I've underlined uh, in the slide, the intensive repetition of the term taqwa, consciousness of God. Um, in this sermon and elsewhere, the invitation to piety, taqwa, frames the entire oration. Muhammad's first sermon, first Friday sermon, is a blueprint for the main doctrines of Islam and also forms the exemplar for one of the Muslim community's defining rites of worship. Muhammad's sermon sets the standard for the ritual Friday sermon of Islam in terms of its exhortative tone, its conventional structure, and its religio-political themes. In all these areas, perhaps most significantly in its pious content, including directions to be conscious of God and remember him to obey God and his prophet, to perform good deeds and prepare for the hereafter, we'll see echoes in the vast majority of Friday sermons to come up to our present day. Uh, Friday sermons most often also had a political and military side to them. In the texts from our period, we see religious advice assimilating with the evolving political aims of the nascent Islamic state. Political themes of the Friday sermon include administrative and, and fiscal policies and their justifications, executive commands, statements asserting the legitimacy of various power groups 
and instructions to the subject populace, primarily regarding obedience to the, le to the leadership. In a classic combination of administrative and spiritual themes, the second Sunni Caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab, said in a Friday sermon, by God, I do not send governors to flay your skin or seize your wealth. I send them so they may teach you your religion. Note also the political implications in the Prophet's Friday sermon. And at the end of section A, you'll see that he enjoins obedience to God and his messenger, which, is, which can be a, a very political um, theme as well. Now, Friday sermons in the Umayyad period often contained threats, much more so than before, right? So in the Umayyad period, we see a lot of this kind of language, both overt and implicit for non-compliance. And here you have an example, the Umayyad governor, Uthba ibn Abi Sufyan, preached a Friday sermon in Mecca during the Hajj season. And this was at the beginning of the dynasty's accession to the caliphate, not long after Ali's death and his son Hassan's abdication. And the residents of Mecca had no love for their new masters. Otba used the pulpit to threaten any would-be rebels in the following strong language. And I'll read out just a couple of lines. Oh, people, we've taken charge of this sacred place, Makkah, in which rewards are multiplied for those who do good, all very pious themes, and sins are multiplied for those who transgress. And he goes on to say, so do not stretch your necks towards another, lest they be cut off. Many a person who makes a wish finds death. I mean, the words sword and whip are the most common vocabulary items in, uh, some of the most common vocabulary items in Umayyad speech, as Umayyad speech is a tribute to the Umayyads, which is really interesting, I think. All right, in addition to political themes, uh, actually, I, just a, a quick word on uh, the Umayyad rulers and their Friday sermons. Uh, the historical narrative presents Umayyad rulers as generally impious. If the characterization is correct, it would indicate that the pious council offered in the fairly large number of Friday sermons attributed to them was dictated by convention. So the early Shi'i poet, Kumait, criticized the Umayyads for preaching piety from the pulpit while in their own lives, and he says they partook of forbidden food and drink. Among Umayyad governors, Hajjaj, um, whom we just saw, is derided by his contemporary, Ibn Abi Burda, so who's an important Sunni scholar, for making pious speeches while acting in a, what he calls pharaonically tyrannical vein. The famous pro-Umayyad preacher Hassan al-Basri, who advocated asceticism, also criticizes Hajjaj for hypocrisy, and he says, do you not wonder at this debauched man? He climbs the steps of the pulpit and speaks the words of prophets, then comes down and assaults, the, uh, assaults people with the assault of tyrants. Now, Hassan al-Basri was in turn censured for impious behavior by Marwan ibn al-Muhallab, who called him the errant show of Shaykh. So according to our sources, some early orators were pious, others were quite the opposite. Regardless, most of their public addresses promoted themes of piety. It would appear that early Islamic society expected orators to underpin oration with religious themes. Now, in addition to political themes, military themes are also observable in Friday and Eid sermons in the form of exhortations to fight in the path of God and defend the community. Um, if you look at the Prophet Muhammad's sermon, I won't go back to the slide here, but it, it, I'll just tell you about it. So in the end of section, in the middle of section E, uh, Muslims are directed to take God and Muhammad's enemies as their own enemies. And this certainly has military implications. Now, for Friday sermons, as I've spoken about right now, combine pious themes with secular themes. Conversely, as I mentioned earlier, a religious component can be observed in all major types of oration in early Islam, including the battle oration and the political speech. So Friday sermons are an obvious repository of devotional material, but battle speeches and political orations are also framed frequently in, in pious themes. Injunctions to piety, taqwa, invocation of prayers, and testamentary Quran citations shore up the orator's authority, and they help him persuade the audience to accept and deploy his policies. The preponderance of leaders, including the prophet, caliphs, governors, commanders, delivered orations in various political, military, liturgical contexts, and these real-world contexts coexisted and intermingled. 
Adi is said to have seldom ascended the pulpit for any purpose without saying at the beginning of his orations, oration, all of his orations, these words of counsel. So he apparently always began, or most often began, with the words, Ayuhannas, people, always remain conscious of God. Ittaqullah. Humans are not created in vain. And this is, again, uh, his standard line. You must not waste your life in frivolities. Further examples include the first Sunni Caliph Abu Bakr's speeches in Medina early in his Caliphate, which disparaged material wealth and pomp. His successor Omar intoned in one of his first Caliphal speeches a series of prayers for himself to be a good Caliph and a good Muslim. His successor Osman's accession speech included censure of the world, along with a large number of Quran quotations. A Quran citation, as one can imagine, was an important mode of pious counsel in political speech, provided religious sanction to the political claim and secured public support. Um, Ibrahim Jumay has written a, a PhD dissertation that he's titled The Use of the Quran in Political Argument. And he writes that Muslims used Quranic allusion to imply comparisons between themselves and between their op op opponents, right, who are usually also Muslim. Quran citation was also frequent in the battle oration. Uh, where orators used verses from the holy book to endorse their point of view. And two Quranic verses that were commonly cited in military contexts both advocate enduring. God is with those who endure. Inna Allah ma'as With God's permission, many a small contingent may overpower a large one, larger one. God is with those who endure. Um, and this verse particularly, I think, adds the element of hope in the face of challenging odds. Two other verses, the next two, that are also cited in battle orations, often refer to the inevitability of death and the ultimate victory of the pious. We belong to God, and to him we shall return. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And this verse is often recited when, you know, has been and continues to be recited when a Muslim passes away. It's also recited then. But it was also a commonly cited verse in battle orations uh, by battle orators kind of trying to persuade their troops to fight. Uh, the last um, verse on the slide here is, the earth belongs to God. He bequeaths it to whomsoever he chooses among his servants. The good outcome is reserved for the pious. So the, the theme of death's imminence is especially suited to warfare. And as we can expect, it's often also connected with martyrdom. We see the Umayyad commander, At-Tab, who is reported to have urged his army to be conscious of God and patiently endure, and then to have spoken of the rewards enjoyed by martyrs. All right, now to the third and final section of my lecture on ritual aspects of the early Islamic oration. Many points can be made about them. Here, I want to talk about these ritual aspects briefly as a form of authority assertion. Early Islamic oration was delivered from a position of power. Its practitioners were leaders, caliphs, commanders, governors, or people with religious weight. Through speeches and sermons, these leaders articulated policy. They solicited support for military and religious political initiatives, and they recruited people to a particular set of ethics and values. Hannah Arendt has argued for the importance of language as an integral medium in constructing political identity. And this was certainly true of the orator leaders of the early Islamic world, where language, and particularly the language of oratory, was vital in the construction of religio-political identity. In addition to a Muslim leader's other qualifications, such as nobility of lineage, wisdom, courage, early conversion to Islam, service in its cause, effective leadership entailed nuanced interpersonal communication. The communal aspect of high-level power brokerage was enacted largely through public oration. Orations were the vehicle of state policy and religious legislation, for important decisions were conveyed to the public almost solely through this medium. They were also the platform of religio-political decision-making, for policy was communally negotiated through them. In many ways, Arabic oration shaped the religious and political landscape of the pre-Islamic and early Islamic period and they were a prime locus of authority. So what were some of the ways specifically in which the ritual of the oration reinforced 
the authority of the orator. The preaching of the Friday sermon was itself a symbol of authority, and attending it was tantamount to accepting that authority. In an exception that demonstrates the rule, the people of Iraq wrote to the Prophet's grandson Hussein in Medina and urged him to take up arms against the Umayyads. And the way these people indicated their disavowal of Umayyad authority was by saying to Hussein in their letters, we've dedicated ourselves to you and we do not attend the Friday service anymore with the Umayyad governor. Next point, the Friday sermon and many kinds of religious political orations were delivered from a pulpit. The battle orator often spoke from the back of a horse. Qus preached from the back of a camel. The orator's higher positioning, in addition to its practical benefits of enabling better seeing and hearing, was also emblematic of his authority over his audience. Uh, another point, the preacher carried a ceremonial staff or sword or bow in his right hand as an emblem of authority. This was rooted in pre-Islamic uh, practice and for Muslims, it connects also with the staff wielded by the Prophet Muhammad, Moses. Jahiz writes about this in quite some detail. Uh, so Moses used the staff to perform miracles. The staff has some symbolic authority. It also had symbolic authority in pre-Islamic Arabia as you know, something wielded by arbiters and so on. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad perpetuated this practice and it became part of his exemplary sunnah. Just a, a very quick aside, in modern times, um, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, or sermons that I watched on YouTube, on YouTube, thankfully I watched them on YouTube because they were very militant and I would not have so, you know, done very well with, with, with uh, at the end of it. Uh, Anyway, so so you have this, you know, the, the uh, an ISIS preacher in Ramadi, uh, th hundreds of thousands of people, and he's standing with a machine gun in his in his hand. So, you know, this is a modern iteration. Uh, staff and sword and so on are also actually symbolically used. When I interviewed in Turkey, uh, people were talking about, oh, this in you know in this particular time, in the there was a time of battle and. The orator in this particular mosque, you know, stood with a sword in his hand and so on. So you have, some of these symbols are sometimes, uh, you know, again, uh, brought out and, and used again. All right. The language register of the early oration was usually classical Arabic. This is in the early sermon that I'm talking about. Uh, and this conveyed an official and authoritative ambience versus colloquialisms or, or dialects of various parts. Right, so mostly they tried to stick to the official um, classical. The use of religious formulae to open and end lent the oration an air of holiness. And since early times, many preachers opened with a verbatim recitation of the Prophet Muhammad's standard praise invocation. Um, citation of Quranic verses infused the or oration, uh, in this case, the Friday oration, a Friday sermon, with the grace and authority of, Quran, of, of God's revelation. The standard structure also gave the oration an air of sacred convention. Now, these physical accoutrements and ritual practices in early Muslim oration all exuded formality and authority. Going forward, the Friday sermon's physical context symbolically invoked the mantle of the prophet and his authority. This is true of medieval times, and as I've shown in some detail in my Arabic oration book, it also applies to our present day. Rituals of all these Muslim sermons across the ages and across the, across the globe have their roots in the Arabic oration of early Islam. And that brings me to the end of my talk. As we've seen, the interaction between religious and secular spheres of oration shows that boundaries between religion and other spheres of life were fluid in the early period of Islam and that the concept of piety and virtue, taqwa, underpinned most orations. Early Arabic oration sat at a rich nexus of religion, ritual, and rhetoric. Thank you for your attention.